This is a typical design of a payment system. Now, most places that you go, you're going to see something similar. And actually, there are some points that can make the system less robust and quite flaky. We're going to go over these points. Here's a quick sneak peek. And we're going to talk about the remedies and how to mitigate the impact of these issues. All right. Now, before we do that, I think it's very important to first dive deep into the design itself and understand how components interact with each other because here we have different kind of services, databases and payment providers and so on. So we're going to do all of that within this video. So if you're ready, let's get started. So this is a typical summary page of your e-commerce platform where the users would end up before making their purchase. So after they click the buy button, a lot of things are going to happen. First of all, we're going to create a payment event. And notice that I'm using the word event here because it kind of signifies that our whole backend architecture is actually an event driven architecture. I'm going to talk about this in details in the second video that comes after that. But for now, just remember that there's a lot of asynchronous stuff happening in the backend. All right. So the payment service that you see here is actually the central service that's also going to interact with a lot of components. But first of all, what it does, it creates a payment order. The payment order is basically a list with the buyer ID here, with the IDs of items that are being purchased with a timestamp of the creation, and we're going to save it in our own database. But after that, we're going to forward this payment order to a payment service provider known also as PSP. So Stripe, for example, is one of the payment service providers. Its direct responsibility is to basically move money from one account into other account. And it may or may not also contact the card scheme based on whether this account is directly linked to some kind of a credit card. If not, it's not going to do that. All right. So now that we know how the heavy lifting is done by the payment service provider, also notice that we have this dotted line here. So to the left of this dotted line, all the components are internal. So we have direct control over them. On the right hand side, we don't have much control because everything here is external. And you probably noticed that we also have these colorful lines because this is exactly what we're going to talk about this. And we're going to start with the second one, meaning the processing delays. The processing delays is actually very crucial because you also probably experienced the fact that the payment service provider takes a while to complete the payment. So we have two options to mitigate that. How, how we can do this is, first of all, make sure to use a long polling. So long polling is when the payment service provider is going to tell our payment service that, hey, your request has been accepted. So it's a 202 HTTP response, but it also gives a polling URL, meaning we can tell the browser, hey, your request has been accepted, but please check this URL from time to time to basically check the status of the payment, whether it's completed, whether it's still processing, and based on that, show something to the user, All right? This is a very common pattern because also Microsoft supports this fully in their API design page. I also made a video about this, so you can check it out. But basically, we're going to return to a two accepted with the polling URL, and it's going to either show completed or failed. And you can try various retry techniques that you like. But coming back to our Blackboard, we also have this green line, which is a webhook. You're probably familiar with that. So whenever we're registering the payment order with the PSB, the PSB knows that, hey, there's some kind of a webhook that I need to call upon completion. And the, the call is going to be registered with the payment service. So now the payment service knows that the payment has been completed and it's going to show a different page to the customer. All right. So these are two techniques that we can use long polling and webhook to mitigate processing delays and very slow processing by PSPs. So you probably noticed that this payment service provider here is actually playing a very important role in our payment system. All right. Not only it's responsible for moving money from one account to another, but it directly correlates with the fact whether we can let our users pay with their credit cards. Maybe we can also let them pay by PayPal, or maybe we can also let them pay by cryptocurrency, because I'm pretty sure most of us are using cryptocurrencies or own cryptocurrencies. And I think it's a no brainer to let your customers also pay by cryptocurrencies. And that's why I want to give a shout out to my friends at Cryptomus. Cryptomus is actually a platform designed for both businesses and your personal use. It has a ton of features that will support every use case that you have. First of all, Cryptomus will handle all the processing needed to make your users 
and you, the merchant, happy. Okay, when I say processing, it's things like building your own crypto exchange, your own crypto gateway, adding a button to your checkout page, and having a limited static wallet for your users. What makes Cryptomus stand out is that it lets you have an authentic and customizable payment page, meaning an ability to add a custom brand logo, a business name, as well as using a custom domain. Cryptomus can convert currencies on the fly. For example, you can accept Bitcoin from the client and have it automatically converted to Tether in your account. This safeguards you from currency fluctuations. It also supports SIPA and SWIFT transactions. And you can easily integrate it with your CMS or use their API directly. On top of that, you can do Cryptomus mass payouts. What is that, you may ask? It's a feature that allows you to make transactions to your customers in a single session, so you don't have to spend any more time managing payments separately. Still thinking whether to register an account on Cryptomus or not? Then let me tell you that it also provides a personal wallet, a P2P exchange, and lets you earn passive income by staking. With that said, I'm sure you now have enough reasons, so do try it out under Cryptomus.com and let me know how you like it. And now back to the video. So now we discussed processing delays, let's go back to reconciliation, our first point. So what is reconciliation? So as you can see here, we have a ledger and user wallet. And as soon as the payment has finished, the payment service actually asynchronously has to update the ledger. Ledger is basically where all the transactions have been saved. So meaning the debit and credit records. And we have the user wallet where the funds of the specific user are saved. It can be an internal, but it can also be a bank account directly depending on the architecture. And they have respective database, meaning these databases actually have to be reconciliated. Why? Because there can be some deviations at some point, because our system is asynchronous. Some of these requests can fail due to network failure, meaning at some point there might be some differences between two databases. And there can also be some differences between the database here of the payment service provider and our internal database. So what do we do to mitigate that? Well, the payment service providers actually offer something called reconciliation. And luckily, this is not something that we have to do. Okay, so the reconciliation is going to happen the following way. We're going to take the ledger, so the database, some kind of a CSV that we can export, luckily, automatically. And we can send this to, for example, our payment service provider so that they can actually verify and, and, and see the differences, whether there are any records missing or the balance is the same, all right? And now you may ask, well, but there's also reconciliation between our ledger and the user wallet, and these are our internal services. Okay, well, the answer is sometimes you need to do that too. So basically what you will have to do is compare two JSON file or two CSV files and see check for differences. If there is a difference and it can be automatically fixed, then your algorithm or the reconciliation program will do this automatically. If there's a difference, for example, there are hundred dollars US dollars less in the user wallet than in the ledger, then someone from your finance team has to jump in and actually look at this problem. All right. But don't forget that reconciliation is something that has to be done probably daily. All right. Now let's go to our third problem, which is item potency. I have a video about item potency, but I think it's also really good to address it in the scope of the payment system. All right. So imagine we have a client and a payment system. The client makes a payment. So let's say in our shopping cart, we we'll click the pay button, we pay $100. But what we get from the server is actually an error. Then we're like, okay, I need to click the pay button again, because probably it didn't work. We make the second payment. And apparently, it's actually being processed, or it is processed successfully. But the server for some reason returns an error. Maybe there's some error and the server is down, or one of the services is down, but the payment actually goes through. And then we try to click it third time. And now server tells us, hey, your payment for 300 bucks has been processed successfully. And you're like, what? I only paid 100. So in order to avoid these kind of misunderstandings, or this kind of issues, it's very crucial to use item potency or make sure that your API that the payment system or this guy here is item potent, meaning it performs one transaction from one single user only once basically to mitigate this issue where one something is stuck in your backend, and it thinks that the user is 
actually wanting to pay three times. So here we have the client. What we're going to do is whenever we make the post request for the payment, we're actually also attaching a new header called item potency key. And this is basically going to be a randomly generated ID. Now, here in our shopping cart, we go back here. So as soon as the user clicks the buy button, this call is going to be made. We're going to attach this header and this header, this unique identifier can actually be the unique identifier of the cart because almost every e-commerce system, the cart has a unique ID for every session. So we're going to attach this unique ID in the header of our call here. And now the payment system can actually return 200 or it can do the payment, but unfortunately return some error. And now the second time when the user tries to retry it, we're still sending the same ID here. And now the payment system knows that the payment has been processed successfully because we also actually save this unique identifier in the database, meaning that, hey, there's a transaction with this ID and it's been processed. Now the payment system knows that this transaction has previously been processed and it's simply going to tell the user that, hey, there are too many requests. This request has already been processed. So don't worry, your payment has been gone through. All right. So guys, check out the video that I, a dedicated video that I have about item potency if you're interested, but this is pretty much what you need to know in this first video about the payment system design. If you have any questions, leave them below in the comments, check out our sponsor Cryptomos, and I will see you guys in the next one. Goodbye.